transition is a must in this energy transitions toward a low carbon environment. So we like it or we don't like it, we must collaborate and we must embrace the changes together uh, among us. Uh, one thing that I would like to highlight is that uh, what I see, uh, two type of collaboration, one is inter-company or inter-industry, one is intra-industry. Uh, uh, what we used to do is that some of the oil companies basically collaborate to solve our own common problems uh, in that situation. But in this situation, in these environments where we are moving towards something new, where we are moving towards something that we are not familiar, I think collaborations inter-industry is also a must. It's also compulsory for us to make it happen. Yeah, for example, oil and gas need to team up with uh, mobility, for example, with healthcare, with IT, all of that. Yeah, I can see uh, hydrogen, for example. If we if we look at hydrogen, one of the components of of potential future energy source. Uh, we can see oil and gas player inside that games. Uh, we also can see some of the CVC type of player is going to that directions, and also some energy companies that moving to that directions. So uh, the, the line splitting the industry is becoming blur and blur every day. So instead of competing, which I do not believe in that idea, uh, I think it's a lot making sense to me if we complement each other, we collaborate so that we can minimize the risk, we can optimize our benefit moving forwards and share the risk and reward uh, together uh, moving forward. Yeah, first of all, uh, we are taking the starting point and we just released a report that said uh, if we're going to get to net zero, 7.5% of global GDP needs to be invested in green capex, 7.5% globally. It's a big number. And so McKinsey has said, we need to make this our next strategic platform for client service. And as part of that, we also said, and, and we in the report, we, we, we say 15 technology areas are, key, are, are representing 60 to 70% of global decarbonization. 15 technology areas. So what we've said is we need to mobilize around each of those and pr help create the facts for the world. So we did it first with the Hydrogen Council, which is basically trying to lay out how fast can hydrogen come down in cost if everybody collaborates on getting scale and technologies to run on. And so what we're trying to do is now to do the same for the next nine technology areas, TCS and direct air capture, long duration storage, etc. And we think our contribution can be to mobilize people around creating the facts to make these themes investable, because that's the th trick now. We need to have all players across the value chain contributing to start doing the first pilot, scale them up and learn and rapidly come down the learning curve. And I'll, I'll steal a, a, a phrase from a, one of our, our newly recruited engineers. He comes from Tesla. And he calls the cost ramp down that companies and technology need to go, go down, uh, the curve of insanity. It needs to come down insanity fast in order for us as a world to really get the technology in place at the cost effective level and thereby drive uh, sustainability towards net zero. So that's how we think about it. Next, I would like to pose a question to James. Yeah, James. So now, can you share with us how important is R&D in helping Formula One teams and the sport to strive for greater sustainability? And how will the 2025 regulation change help the sport to reach its sustainability targets? As a result of, of trying to make a fast car, focusing completely and utterly on performance, we, we sort of accidentally are good at doing things that, um, that other people find useful. Uh, we, we, we care a lot about efficiency because we, um, if nothing else, a Formula One car is a sort of embodiment of engineering efficiency. You have a rule book which tells you what you must follow, and then the person who follows that rule book in the most efficient way will come out at the end of it with a car that is the fastest. 
And in order to be able to follow that rule book in an efficient way, you have to plow an awfully large percentage of what you do into R&D. So most of our company is an R&D company. We are trying to investigate how we can do better next year, what we did pretty well the year before, but what won't be well good enough for, for next year's championship. So we're putting all of our, or very large part of our effort into R&D to try and make our cargo faster. Along the way, we produce something that is, is pretty efficient um, and, uh, and happily efficient in ways that are, are generally helpful uh, um, in other industries. We're, we're very good at taking mass out of stuff. We're, we're um, rather good at energy management. We're pretty good at drag reduction. These are all things that are right at the heart of the challenges that the automotive industry faces in giving itself a more sustainable future. Now, we're not doing that directly to help the automotive industry have a better and more sustainable future. We're doing it to make a faster racing car. But happily, the byproduct is useful. And we do have, um, for what is just a sort of small branch of the entertainment industry, we do have quite a global reach and we do have a very visible presence. And so that, that sort of advance that we're able to make in, in those areas is helpful. Now, it's particularly helpful when it isn't accidental, when it isn't just a sort of serendipitous byproduct of wanting to win a, win a race. And when it works at its best is when the sport is taking a regulatory direction, when it's making that rule book that I mentioned earlier on, when it's making that rule book give us incentive to develop technologies that are directly useful. So for 2026, uh, there is a new regulation coming in to the sport uh, which is going to change the, the power unit, the engine. Um, it's going to change it to a more, uh, a more sustainable version of the engine we're running at the moment. And crucially, crucially, the fuel for that engine will need to be 100% sustainable fuel. And that is a, an area where Petronas, as our, as our fuel partner, are playing a great role in helping us uh, prepare for that so that we can have completely competitive fuel that will help us win races, but uh, as a result of the direction that the sport has taken from a regulatory point of view, will push the R&D and the development of that fuel uh, forwards. And as a result, will indirectly benefit something which has much broader, a much broader um, impact than the small amount of fuel that the cars themselves use as they, as they go around the tracks uh, entertaining audiences. So with digital transformation as the forefront of energy transition, how does this create more impact towards sustainable energy production and a zero emissions future? So essentially, the question revolves around the, the role of digital in mm. accelerating energy transition. Yeah, I think it's it's key. Uh, just to start with some of the things you are are, are alluding to, both Thomas and, and uh, Charles Hall, you know, the, the way of turning targets uh, to actions, because I think all of us have been in this you know, PowerPoint mode for uh, some years and, and actually turning all the digital opportunities into, into something real, I think, is the threshold that we are at. And, uh, and I guess there's some somewhat a paradox that, uh, you know, we, we're embracing it uh, all the time in our private lives. But uh, And there we are just jumping into a digital version of ourselves. But in, in our professional lives, things tend to go a bit slower. And if, if uh, our starting point is, is oil and gas, uh, and as you say, Charisal, we have a lot of the right opportunities and and, uh, and the resources to actually be forward leaning on developing uh, new technologies and, and making taking them into use. Uh, but it goes a bit slow. Um, uh, and I think you know it, it's perhaps back to how we have been, uh, you know, setting up uh, our own sort of competition in the in the sort of the industry environment how we have created silos and sort of vertical lock-ins when it comes to digital uh, digital solutions. So, so that's something to break down. Uh, and I think one of the things that we are doing now, which then talks to the, the energy transition part of it, is actually to set targets for our own carbon footprint. Because uh, and we, we made that a target for the whole organization. 
uh, we do it to create awareness and consciousness, but also to increase the competence level. And we invite the whole organization to actually contribute with solutions. And so many of those solutions are based on digital uh, technology. So I think that's the, the first comment for me that, you know, we need to create this cultural uh, program which is sort of self-propelled in its nature so that the whole big organization and the industries across companies are actually doing it from, from the inside and not being sort of suppressed uh, digital program.